<laughs> Ciao, guys. Hello. What's up? Oh, hello. I'm very happy when there's the not only the two of us, but it's the three, the four of us. I mean, as many people as possible. Today, we really have someone special. And we promise, guys, that we're going to give you like the best of the best of the most conventional people that we could find. And I love that we have yeah. Natalie with us. Um, if I have to make her like an intro for her, I would say that she's a fantastic web comic artist uh, and is really rocking Instagram with her irony field, uh, great job net. Uh, it's a great account. She's an LA based screenwriter. She's a performer and a director in an upcoming short field that she's making. But she's also a professional that measure in, I think, mechanical engineering. She has started and designed a kickstart coffee maker. She has studied footwear in London. She is doing improv as well. And last but not least, uh, she used to play college at a very high level and she won a national title here in the United States. So I would say it's a lot. And please welcome what I call the <laughs> uber talented <laughs> Natalie Griffin. I will add some <laughs> it, it was such a mind blowing intro that now I'm 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 just thinking about how is it even possible to combine all these things, Natalie. Yeah, I don't know. Um I have I was gonna say I have like a very short attention span, but it's more like I don't know. Maybe endless curiosity. I don't know what it was. I also think wow. I was raised as a competitive athlete, so I played soccer my whole life. So that was always kind of a given. It was like the baseline under everything. Um So I, when I was eight, I told my parents that I was going to go to Stanford and they were like, okay, well, you have to pay, figure out a way to pay for it. Um, I was like eight, but I was like, okay. Um, so then I don't know Then my goal from then on was like, okay, I'm going to get like a soccer scholarship. That's what I'm going to do. Um, and that was kind of, I guess, like what my entire little crazy person life built up to. Um, yeah. Then went to Stanford studying mechanical engineering because I wanted to do something that was practical. Uh -huh. Um, mm. Because so I'm from like, I'm half Mexican. So I just feel like that side of my family, it's like very much more about like the, the practical something where I wanted to do something that um, maybe would even be kind of, I don't know, impressive in some way. I think I always also felt like I wanted to be not a boy, but like I wanted to do boy things. So I really liked sports and then I liked engineering, which was, they were both seen as, as boy things. And I think now that, you know, women are now seen as people um now they're becoming women things too um but yeah it was like a, just the thing that i wanted to to do to i guess i don't know fortify myself like in that i just wanted to be like legitimate so then i did that but then i'd always written growing up like just prose mm -hmm. i was a very dark child though so it was all creepy and weird and like i i was like kind of a i don't know very like dark since everybody was always getting murdered in every story that I was writing. Um, but I just had the prose thing. And then I moved to New York after college. And then that's where I found um, like my screenwriting like mentor. I went to a screenwriting school there, like a little workshop place because I was always interested in kind of flirting with it. I moved out there for a tech job, but then started doing improv, found the New York comedy scene and then found screenwriting, which I didn't think anybody really did. I always thought that was like a wizard mm -hmm. thing. I didn't understand. Nobody in my family is in entertainment, in TV, in anything. Um, so that's why it took me so long to get around to it. Because I just didn't think that that was a thing that actual people did. I thought you had to be born into it. I thought you had to, like, know people. And that's mm. still largely true. But, like, I still was like, no, I'm going to also do it. And then uh, moved here after writing a couple things. So, to L.A. I'm curious to know. Wow. And I've done something similar. Like, when did you, I call it my um, professional epiphany, when I realized that, I was studying as an engineer and I realized I don't want to do engineering stuff. Uh, and I switched into management yeah. consulting and digital strategy. And I think it's the most important uh, aspect of my career so far, because it's when I realized, oh, this is not the stuff I want to build. Was the same with you? Like as you were studying mechanical engineer, there was a moment where you said, oh, no, I know that this is my call. Or were you just ex experimenting with your life? I mean, I always knew that it wasn't like my calling. I knew that it wasn't going to be something that was going to, I guess, like feed my heart. Um, mm -hmm. But I thought it was kind of cool mm -hmm. to make physical stuff. And when I was an athlete too, it's like, I was very much like, I felt everything in my body in a way. So it was just like, it was another thing I could do that was very physical. Um, so I liked power tools and I liked building things and all of that. But I took uh, 
also fiction. I took one fiction class at Stanford and that I got an A plus. That was my one A plus. And it was because that's always been the thing that I wanted to do. And it was like, I couldn't, that class had nothing to do with my major. It didn't advance my degree anymore. And yet I like put more effort into that class than any other thing because I don't know. I knew that that's always what I wanted to do, but I guess because of that, I had faith that it would always find me at some point. So I should just try something else. But then, yeah, when I realized that, like, I don't know, I thought about working for Tesla right after uh, college. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, okay, if I do the mechanical engineering thing, I'm just going to end up working on the door handle for Tesla forever. Like that was my fear. I was like, I don't want to do like a tiny thing. I want to think about a million things. I know that I need to be surrounded. I need to be in like a snow globe of, of something. I need that feeling. I don't know what that means. So then I just moved to the most chaotic place I could think of, which is New York. And I figured it would just show me eventually. I think you embody what I've, and I've been reading about it because I, I think I belong to that people as well. Uh, what is called a multipotentialite. I don't know if you ever heard mm -hmm. uh, or like uh, I've watched the TED no, Talk. That sounds like it's <laughs> no, it's, <laughs> it's phenomenal. I, I will put the link here and, uh, and in the article. It's, uh, it's kind of those people who feel that they have multiple callings uh, and they never feel like they mm. get to a point where they <laughs> excel in one thing, especially if they, because they don't want to. Because they feel like I'm doing this thing and I want to learn about this and that. And I feel like you, you are really a multipotentialite for those who feel and have the, even the imposter, the imposter syndrome, right? When you're feeling, oh, but I'm not very good. I'm doing this and that. It's part of being a multipotentialite. So people are just embracing it now. And it's very, very, very enlightening. Mm -hmm. Cool. I wanted to start with great job net. That is one word. And it's the name of your Instagram account. And we all have Instagram and it's super cool and it's super engaging. But it's definitely not the typical account that you guys will follow. Uh, definitely not a model account, anything like that. It's a, it's a comic, uh, web comic book, right? I would love mm -hmm. to know more about the genesis of this project uh, and I will describe it. So yeah, great job, Nat. Um, so yeah, my, I don't know, my Instagram just used to be like anybody, I don't know, else's Instagram. I was just posting pictures of, I don't know, myself and it was weird. I felt pointless and I think, it came out of a couple different things. Screenwriting, first of all, takes so long. It is such a long process. And it's kind of, it's almost hilarious to try to explain to my family even the timeline of things. Because it's like now I'm taking out, for example, right now, especially with COVID and everything, animation is a very big deal, like even bigger than it was. And I love animation. So it's like I'm going to be taking out a couple of animated pitches. But those take so long. So it's like my family's like, when can we watch it? And I'm like, I don't know, I'm like eight years. It takes so yeah. long to make these things. Um, I'm going to be like 62 by the time that my first thing comes out and whatever. So in the meantime, I was like, I need something quick to turn out that will keep me sane and that I can use for, I don't know, like I had so much pent up, like snarky, sarcastic, whatever things that I kind of just like wanted to flip out that I thought other people would mm -hmm. enjoy. And I'd been following a couple of other web comic accounts and I really liked those. And I was like, well, I've been drawing stupid little characters since I was in, you know, like second grade. So maybe I should just start seeing what I can do with that. So, um, yeah, I kind of just wanted to then make my Instagram into like a testing ground, I guess, for little quick ideas that I could turn out. It, it's, it's the web comic, but there's also just so many different things now that I'm like, okay, hmm, like what else can I throw on there? Can I throw on like little short videos? Can I put like stupid pictures of myself with like text superimposed? Um, how can I then, I guess, even be like an alter ego in this thing? So it's kind of like a myriad of things. It's just like for mm. my quick jokes that I want to communicate. And then, yeah. And it, in a way is like then also creating like this, this other person who can like hold all of my angst for me when I'm just trying to be normal in my actual life. Do you talk of this experience with your Instagram, like a stream of consciousness in a way? So you, you just yeah. pop up stuff and whatever. My point now is how would you see the profile like in from here in 10 years or no, 10 and it's not like five years let's post it like five well okay i can't i guess i can't speak too much about it but like it's um i'm currently working with a producer to make um some animated shorts of great job matt that i'm taking out as like a full like like as a pitch so yeah. then that that will mm -hmm. like then be an animated version of then myself and my weird little twiddlings and that's like a whole nother level because i love animation like i said so that's like one version of it but then in terms right. of what the account will become i think the account will always underscore whatever else I do, because there's like a bunch of 
other things that I'm always like working on, especially like I said, screenwriting stuff that takes forever in the short that I'm filming with my little brother and all these different things. So as those progress, it's weird. I think that's why I don't even put too much effort into like promoting the web comic. Like I probably should. Because, like, for example, a lot of the webcomic people that I'm even friends with or follow, it's like they have, like, 150K people or, like, 500K sometimes. And I'm like, that's crazy. And they've made a whole life out of it. But I think because I'm doing so many different things, I kind of trust that, like, that will always be, like, my weird cult following. (laughs) And then whatever else I do will actually be, like, my professional life. I don't ever want the webcomic to be beholden to other people's expectations, I guess, is what I mean. So that's why I'm hesitant to be like, this is going to be the four. Like, it's not, if anything, it's given me more confidence in my other creative endeavors in a way where I don't feel the need to then make that maybe my business because I kind of like that I can say whatever I want to say on that thing. I love it because, I mean, as a fan, and I, uh, when I randomly stumbled upon your your profile and I started watching all those web comics, what I really love is that there was different experiments going on all the time. Uh, and we'll add a couple of, for those that are not listening or that will be reading the article or watching on YouTube, we will add a couple of your uh, creation here and there. But the idea is you can find very different comics. Like sometimes there are like those characters and you uh, in, in there discussing. Sometimes there is like those little books that pop out. Sometimes you have oh, visual yeah. and graphs. So I found it super entertaining because it, it was always different. And the other thing that I really loved is how you... I've always been engaging with your audience, even in kind of adju- not adjusting your style, but crafting something new. I remember at some point uh, there was something, correct me if I'm wrong, where you were asking, I don't know, should I make eyes to my characters? Should I add color? Should I make like uh, the nail polish? There was something crazy like that. Yeah, I don't know. I I also, I really like overusing for like certain features on Instagram because I think that they're so silly. Again, everything is stressful in this day and age. That's like why I think most of my projects are kind of about like, I don't know, either it's, it's alleviating in some way, whether it's bringing people back into their bodies, whether it's like a laughing, whatever it's like, okay, instead of getting all hardo about like politics or whatever, which is like, I I believe in taking a stance to the degree that it's like, you know, for the betterment of society, obviously. But I think when I then have like some wiggle room to just like throw a poll up, that's like, Let's think about this thing that really doesn't matter, but like I'm going to just like plague you with a dramatized version of like my personal everyday stresses and make you decide um, is just funny to me because then it's like, I don't know, like I even I'll post like a picture and then just be like, hello or go away. Like that's like in the yeah. poll. Like that's and I think that that's funny because it's like I think about that so many times even watching other people's stories. Or like, it's almost, it's still, it's always like, hello or go away. So they're always, I don't know. It's like a bunch of kind of social experiments that are also really rooted, I think, in spending far too much time on the internet and then wanting to, I don't know, then yeah, do something that's stupid and random and makes, looks like it for a minute. So I like that. I, I think we should we should write a book on your this kind of creative process that you are talking about because it's amazing. Because I at the end, I, should, I, I think I think we're we're getting in this direction. I'm so curious to ask you more about your creative process. How do you get inspired? Because I know I know that your I, I can feel that your mind is there's something there, right? So, so, yeah, it, it's amazing. We love that. We we love that. But. If you if you would have like a pen to write, okay, my name is my name is Natalie, and this is my creative process in steps. Um, let's see. I'm like trying to think of some through lines because really my creative process, if I were to describe it, um, would be loose spaghetti. Nice. <laughs> just like you know, like just wet spaghetti that you dropped on the floor, and then you're like trying to make the noodles into a necklace. Like that's kind of how it goes. But I guess in like actually what I do in maybe real human words. I, I write by hand a lot because it's like, if I can feel connected to it, usually the first draft of anything I write by hand. So I have like a sketchbook. Um, I used to keep a journal and then I, I pull, I still pull a lot of stuff from old journals. So when I feel like devoid of inspiration, I go to my iPhone notes or I go to my like physical journals. Cause my iPhone notes also were just like a bunch of, I have like a million folders of things that I've been keeping tabs of. And if I think of a joke, I'm probably insufferable in some ways to my friends because I'm like, type it down really quick. And I'm like, okay, proceed. Because I know that like, I'll use it eventually. And if I forget it, it like then and if I'm, I'm, if I'm out of ideas, 
and I don't have wow. those lists, it becomes really difficult. So I pull from the lists and then if I get stuck, I'm constantly going between writing and drawing because if I get stuck in one, then I can usually draw up something that then will inform the writing, even in stuff that's like not part of the webcomic, even like scripts. So there's that. And then when I feel like creatively terrified, which is often, which is when I'm like, I will never have an idea again. I wish to die. <laughs> then um, I, then I, it's, I trick myself into doing stuff that like, okay, for example, if I really can't think of anything and I need to finish like a scene in a screenplay, uh -huh. for example, I type almost all of my dialogue in any of my scripts first on my iPhone notes because I'm convinced that I, cause then I don't even look, I'm looking up and I'm typing things down as I'm like seeing them happen. And then I just have like this label list, like the character, I only, I know who the characters are. Like if somebody were to read it, they'd be like, this person is having a psychotic break. But like, then I can at least then take that again. That's why I guess what I mean by loose spaghetti and then fashioning into a necklace is it has to just be shameless chaos that then I like pull things and then start to order them together. So it always though begins as like being very scared, not looking at my phone, typing really fast and then making from that or like writing in a notebook and then pulling from that and then making that into like a real thing. So that's usually, those are usually the steps. That reminds me of two things I've been reading a lot, uh, in, uh, especially when they try to organize those ideas into design thinking process. And like yeah. the first part is more about like when they say the free flow of ideas uh, and in ideation, they always said, don't put any limits, just write as much as you can. Don't do any filter, just make, make sure yeah. you capture every freaking stupid, weird idea that you have and capture it. And then you will do the prioritization and the selection that uh, I hear from you. And also, I guess, sticky notes. I would like really promote sticky notes. They're great. They're always on my uh, wall. Nice. There's always something right. that, like, then I give it and just I put. I actually have discovered these sides of sticky notes that is not the regular Pretty one. Great. Yeah. That, I, that is amazing for doing like trees and connecting dots, and it's, it's super interesting. Yeah. So sticky notes are great. Impermanence is great. Anything that you can, like, just write on really quickly and again, yeah, not treat too preciously, like you were saying. Um, mm. Or you can write down your stupidest ideas and you don't feel like, oh God, I'm ruining like um, a page of my like expensive moleskin journal. Don't buy moleskin journals because you'll never write down anything that isn't poetry to you. Um, mm. oh. So I, I never, I only use that for like a journal. That is then. so cool. Yeah, like buy shitty journals. Like buy. I, I, I'm buy writing on a moleskin, but. But, but it, it's like it, it's like an empty paper, right? So it's yeah. not that kind of perfect lines and yeah. Uh, so it, so it, it's a mess. It's a mess. My journal, like in terms of like when I like diary things, like I have a moleskin uh -huh. for that. But like with the okay. web comic, no, because like sometimes I'll draw like really stupid Venn diagrams that make like no sense, and I don't really want to waste like a nice paper for that because I'm like I don't know if I'm gonna do anything with this. I don't know what this even means. <laughs> Shitty journals, if there's anything, that's what I'm like the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much. The second thing that I got into my mind that, that you sparkle is that you also do this sort of um, slow multitasking. Like you're not just focusing on one thing at a time, but you oh, keep constantly, yeah, right? You're, as a two, also speaks to the multipotential light. You can just focus on something because everything inspires you. Like from going to the kitchen and to the restroom or going to grocery shopping. Everything is like boils into your that head of yours. Right, which is horrible and a mental illness. But it does sometimes then breed like good, good things. But yeah, it's like, um, I don't know, even in thinking about the character of Nat when I've been kind of drafting, you know, what does the long form version of this character look like? I always have her like, I don't know, there's like music on in the background and also a podcast is playing something like very serious, like about Syria. And then she's also like, you know, in the fridge, like looking for something. And it also, there's a yoga video playing from her iPad that she's just not doing. There's just like a million things going on all around sometimes. Not always. Cause I've also then recently found that meditation is actually pretty great. But when I feel stopped up, yeah, it's like a million things could be going on. And for some reason, occasionally just synapses kind of connect and then pff, something happens. So there is wow. another thing that I uh, I would like to discuss with you uh, out of the two two thousand different things that you're doing, and mm. it's the short film. 
that is coming coming in uh, in fall 2020 uh, oh, yeah. right and i love it because it's going to be and correct me if i'm wrong uh, an autobiographic comedy that is called Ant and Net are one whole mexican and you describe it as a sister and brothers comedic exploration of the latinx identity now yes. the reason why we really love this is that Mm -hmm. Literally, our last episode, Rafael and I focus about designing for belonging. And now belonging is so important as the intersection of uh, uh, diversity, inclusion, and equity. And we're really curious to know from you and from your experience, what it's like to build and create a short film about something like racial identity? Interestingly enough, actually, I just was on a call this morning with a DP for this, um, who's going to be shooting it. And I think now we're pushing to September. We've had to push. So, cause this is going to be shot months ago, like right when, again, COVID and everything happened. Mm. Um, the thing that we're thinking about doing now though, actually is kind of like a reframe of this, um, not only racial identity, but just like these two kind of disparate personalities, which are my brother and I. So my brother's name is Anthony, okay. Aunt, I'm Natalie, Nat. Um, and in some ways, personality wise too, we are also anagrams of one another, which is why I wanted to then, have these two characters in an environment together. Um, because whereas I am very outwardly expressive and constantly thinking too many things and all this, everything, my brother is kind of like the sweetest little bean you've like ever met. And he's like, just very, again, also very expressive, but in a way where it's like, you'd never know that anything is ever wrong with him. Whereas like, if something is wrong with me, you'll know immediately. Cause I'm like, something is wrong. And it's like, okay, mm -hmm. calm down. But then yeah, with him, it's like, it's all behind his, his eyes. So I wanted to see how these two opposite people would react in any situation. I've had to reframe it from this thing, Antonat or One Whole Mexican, even though, again, it does have a lot to do with their, their half Mexican identities. Um, but we're now thinking about shooting something because it was going to be my grandma's house. But the reason that we can't do like the original plan that we were going to do is because I don't really want anybody around my grandma. Like, especially because the, I was joking around with her the other day because I was like, <laughs> abuela, this thing is like about you being dead. And like, I don't really want to then manifest that by like having people in your house and then something happens. I don't want you to get sick. I don't want anything to happen. So now we're reframing it and kind of rethinking it into being something that we can shoot at my place in Los Angeles. So it will still touch on this whole Latinx identity and what that means um, in kind of the context of two characters who now are stuck in perpetual night is actually like what the, the show, what it was going to be about. So we've just had to reframe it. But yeah, it's, it's definitely still going to touch on the Latinx thing just because that's been very formative in even, I don't know. Yeah, like crafting a perspective as an, as an artist or whatever. It's like, what am I allowed to take um, ownership? And the internet doesn't allow you to take ownership of much if you look like I do. Um, they're like, you're not anything. And I'm just like, look, I've been rolling tortillas since I was like a little girl. So like you can step off, but it's weird because it's like, again, it, it all depends on what you look like. It all depends on what like, your background is. Um, I don't know. It's really interesting. I've had a million conversations about it with my mom and my grandma and my mom tells me, she's just like, stop pronouncing words like a gringa. And I'm like, oh, I know, but I feel awkward for my other friends. If I'm like, I don't know, like Venezuela, like I, it's, it's we, even though like, that's again, what I grew up around. It's, it's interesting. Cause you like are trying to navigate it all the time without feeling like uh -huh. a farce. Um, so yeah, that's where that whole idea kind of came from. But now, even though I would have loved to film the original thing that I was thinking of, it just seems too risky with, with my grandma. So my brother and I are gonna figure out another way to, to touch on that. How would you describe, and if you, if you want to share like this, this experience of being a member of the Latinx community in the multiple jobs and uh, uh, gigs that you do, do you feel like it's a plus? Because very honestly, and both me and Raffaele being Italian, there is this stuff about, like Madonna used to say, right? Italian do it better. Yeah. So everyone loves Italian, right? Oh, you're Italian, super cool. I want to be Italian. So we don't come, we don't feel any of that difficulties to some extent. Actually, we take an advantage. Mm -hmm. So we're extremely biased to some extent. And we're extremely fortunate. Mm -hmm. How is it, I mean, for like a big, from the Latin community, uh, being a woman, especially in, a, in the last few years, because you've been living in New York, in LA, and I know it's very vibrant. What, what's, what's been your experience like? Growing up, it was different because growing up, like looking back, if I were to like do like a psychological unpacking of how I grew up, um, 
like I said, I always wanted to do boy things. Like when I was little, I watched, first of all, Lion King twice a day, every day. I don't know why my parents let me do that. Um, but the person that I, I always identified with Simba and I never thought about it as like, oh, I'm not like a boy. I was like, oh no, like I'm the lead and I'm Simba and that's me and that's who I am. And so like, mm. I don't know, it was something I think about also growing up really being close to my dad, like so close that he would often turn around and elbow me in the head when I was little. Cause I'd just be like, I'm following you. I love you. Um, and so I was really interested. In, he was interested in comic books. So like I was interested in comic books and then my parents would put me into sports and then there was that. And I don't know. I think even part of me growing up around my like Mexican family, um, maybe even subconsciously, I was kind of like, I want to be, I want to be one of the boys more than I do. I felt afraid, not even that I didn't want to be girly or like a girl because my style was always kind of like an overlap. Um, mm. but I was, I think I was just, I was afraid. I was afraid that like femininity meant vulnerability. So I was like, I'm going to like Iron Man armor myself by being an athlete, by being an undeniably good athlete and by being an undeniably good student. And then I can do whatever I want and I can write my own ticket. Um, and then, yeah, it was a weird thing because then it wasn't until like, so then I did at Stanford and I did all the things that I'd set out to do. And weirdly then being at Stanford felt like a hiatus from my personality in some ways, because it was just so like, you know, high achievement, which is always what I'd gone for. And then it wasn't until then in my adult life and moving to New York and like experiencing creativity in a different way and doing all these things, and then to LA and doing the same and finding my community of people that I also in my relationships and my like adult relationships was like, Oh my God, I've only ever been emulating like my dad. And then wanting, for example, like my abuelo to like think that I'm great um, like cause with the, with the athlete thing, he was always so stoked on my soccer playing abilities. And even to this day is like, you should have done the Olympics. You should have done all this stuff. Like you should have just continued your career into the pros, whatever it was, even though I never really wanted that. Um, so I don't know, like it wasn't until like my adult life, I guess is what I'm saying to then loop all this back around, um, that I started to really actually then come back to really respecting my mom in a way that even growing up, I was so afraid in some ways of being not her, but just, I never wanted to be spoken down to. Even now it's like I bristle any time that I feel like a male energy is like condescending toward me because I'm like, you have no idea. Like I have done all the work where you cannot condescend to me. Um, but yeah, I think that now it's like, oh man, the thing that then makes me even possible to work with ever, or just like a good person is everything that I've gotten from my mom. Because that woman, mm -hmm. like, especially like being the Latin woman that she is, it's like, I feel more in touch with my sexuality. I feel more in touch with just like being like a warm person and then being somebody that people want to be around. It's like my dad, even if you hug him, I like to say that he like hugs like a, like a, like he used to at least hug like a Ken doll, like plastic. Mm -hmm. Now he's gotten much better. Um, mm -hmm. But like I, then my mom is very hands-on, very, it's, it's a Latin thing, you know, it's like you walk into the home and she just like, I mean, she grabs my dad by the back of his neck and he's like, eh. like, it's just, it's much more like hands-on and, and like funny and whatever. So I really, I don't know, that's been like the best change that I've made later in my life. And that's then how I've been, I guess, getting in touch with, yeah, the more Mexican side. That's when I feel weirdly the calmest actually is when I'm most in touch with that side of my family. And that's where even in now, yeah, I don't know. Like my current character aesthetic and the female characters that I write and draw and all of that stuff, they feel warmer. They have like more blood when I'm thinking of them and I think the Mexican way uh, as opposed to, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, the, like the weird male achievement thing where I was like, maybe if I achieve enough, I can trick everyone into thinking I'm wow. a man. And then that was, now I don't want that at all. I love the message I that you spread because uh, I think... Uh, uh, we also want to connect different countries uh, with this kind of podcast and different mentality, different mindset. And for us coming from Europe, we, we love the kind of like love and diversity message that you spread. Uh, and so people can really understand people that are living like in the Europe side of the world, how things work uh, mm. from like where we live right now. Uh, from like me and Nat, like living in, uh, in the United States is, is completely different from uh, how we grew up in, uh, in Europe. Uh, so I love and thank you for sharing that. And I also love how you mm -hmm. send this message about being always self-aware and from self-aware, getting that energy and feed your diversity at different stages in your life. I, I think it's a it's a phenomenal message for whoever listen and especially uh, inspire 
maybe the next generation of like a female soccer player because in Italy all the males want to play and we got no no female ones and then in the US the females are the ones that kick ass so I love that and, and sure. it's like we're at least in the forefront of that for sure um, we are which is something to be very proud of I think I love the message too actually I, I think it's time for our signature question Fed. what do you think go for it fire it up because uh, it's, it's up to me right so Nat My question for you now is, mm -hmm. what is your definition of a designer nowadays? Mm. Well, <laughs> I guess having been in the, because like, so I, I studied mechanical engineering, but it was in the product design program at Stanford. So it's like there was a design school and everything, but then I also got to see, which mm -hmm. is very cool. I think that... Designers in this day and age, it's almost like they are creating like whatever the infrastructure is that exists just on the outside of reality, if that makes sense. Like they are then like designing then what is the, what are the daily augmenters of our reality? I think like that's what designers do because like they give context to things in our phones in a way that then is applicable to like our physical lives. So that whether it's in storytelling, whether it's in app designing, web designing, it's, yeah, it's creating whatever, like if you imagine like, yeah, I don't know, like reality has like a little sphere. It's like, what are like the little beams and things that are then creating this like exoskeleton? That's what they're doing. If that wow. makes any sense at all. <laughs> yeah. I think it's sense. beautiful. I love it. Yeah. I, I just wrote it down. No, no, no. It's, it, it was amazing. The first part I just made designer definition and I just, what is it? What she's saying, it's, it's great, Nat. It's great. Thank, Thank you, you so much. And you are, I mean, <laughs> you're just in your story. Like, you, I, I feel like I'm already there where you, when you are talking about something or where you're talking about. And this is, it's a skill that for me, it's super valuable. I mean, keep, keep doing this good work, whatever you want to call it or whatever you want to label it. Keep doing it. Right. Thank you. That's very reassuring considering I'm going, I'm testing out like a monologue <laughs> show at the top of next year. So hopefully that goes well. This has also been like a really cool, like kind of storytelling clinic uh, to some extent, because you've been great in, uh, in sharing with us everything about your, your life and your ideas and your projects. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, that the article that will come along with, uh, with this episode will be plenty of the things that we referred to uh, the links and the things that you created, uh, all the different articles that we mentioned. So uh, please mm. take a look at that. And I really love your website. Let me start with that one, because I think it's a good way to start. In a, if someone is asking, how can I get in touch with uh, Net a little bit better? And your website is greatjobnet.com, right? Yeah, it has everything on there. I'm trying to then streamline the mm -hmm. chaos into something that's accessible i'm not gonna spoiler anything about the website and i'm intentionally not putting we won't be putting any uh screenshot of the website we want you to go and and take a look at that because there are some really neat surprises on it so go and visit it but yeah. the only thing we want to mention and i think you 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 say that like a few minutes ago you are working on a new podcast right yes yeah, so there's two big projects i guess actually Um, one of them I've told you about before. So then I'm doing like a, an interview series starting next month is when I'm aiming to, to start it called Nat Talks You Out of the Apocalypse. Um, because I've met like enough interesting people over the, over the years that I'm like, okay, I want to do like this little interview series where whatever the point is, is it's like tackling at least what that person thinks maybe could be the worst thing to come in the next couple of years and then almost disproving it. Or it's like if they have like an optimistic view of what's going to happen talking that up to, to death, like where it's just like, things are going to be okay. Because even with some of my friends, what I love is just like when they call me and they're just like, I'm freaking out. And I'm, I feel like in some ways, one of my greatest talents is being like a hype man for anything. So I'm pretty good at making people feel better by just being like, no, this is why everything's going to be okay. What are you doing? You should be excited about that for these reasons. And then the show is kind of built around this idea, I think of both making people better, but also then introducing them to like new things that people are kind of working on, whether it's like, you know, interviewing friends that work for NASA or whatever it is. So yeah, it's called that mm -hmm. talks you about the apocalypse. Um, but the monologue thing I was talking about, which is also on the website, 
that's coming, I think, at the top of next year. And that is just a live show. It's like an art installation show. It's a controlled comedy show um, called Cake and Violence. And that is like these, it's like this circular room. There's these six big art pieces that lead you around this story that brings the audience back into the, their body is kind of the, the point of the thing. Um, because I like to say, like, after having been raised as an athlete my whole life, the only two things that make me feel anything anymore are cake and violence. So that's like the kind of, the, uh. um, and it leads everybody. Yeah. Like back into, um, their body over really like six, uh, stages of this story where we're going around in the clock and we, we begin and end at the same point. There's about 10 audience members. They all sit on stools that then turn with the story. Um, and then I think I'm going to stream it as well as then have this controlled audience because, so it's important to have a controlled audience in this day and age. I don't want to be filling up a stadium, nor do I really want to anyway. It doesn't really fit the story, but that is then the other thing. So those are the two big next things, the big talking things. Uh, yeah. Is Perhaps. that going to be in LA? Yes, that's where it's going to be. It's going to actually, I'm going and seeing a space for it. I'm looking at spaces now. Um, that's also why I moved into like this big loft space. because I'm going to do like a trial here with a couple friends. Um, but one of my friends just opened a studio space in, in downtown LA. So I'm going to go look at that as being the first, um, location. And if not that, then it'll be something like that. Probably someplace in, in downtown. So I'll let you know. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, we're looking forward to it. I'll come and visit for sure. It sounds awesome. I already, I'm drooling already. Yes. There will be a, a big cake featured in every one of the shows that will be destroyed. So that's another fun part of the thing. Ooh. That's phenomenal. Yes. Cool. So we'll see how well, be some weird experiment, but whatever. I just want to say, not. Uh, I mean, great job, phenomenal job, uh, amazing. I feel like I've been uh, um, an overdose of creativity this uh, afternoon mm -hmm. from you. I I don't know how to thank you for being with us. It was super entertaining. Absolutely. And I will will stay in touch. I can wait to see what's next. And guys. Again, the website. Totally agree. Great job. Yeah, thank you both. Com. Thanks for having me. And thanks for listening to me ramble for so long. Sorry. <laughs> <I'll>, <laughs> it's lovely. Lovely Love ramble, that. if you want to call it like that. Really? Thank you again. Yeah. And I'll talk to you soon. Enjoy your yeah, vacation. You. Bye. Thank you, Nat. Ciao, ciao. Thanks a lot. Ciao.